we need to talk. Success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. And by the way, fulfillment is as unique as there are people. Achievement, there's laws, right? You do this, this. Money, there are laws. Your body, there's laws. We all have biochemical, special, unique identities, but there's certain fundamentals. If you do them in mass, you're going to be overweight. If you do them differently, you're going to be fit and strong. Same thing with money. But fulfillment is as unique as art. Art is what one person thinks is beautiful, somebody else can think is ugly, and that's perfectly fine. If you're gonna master something, you need to get the repetition where you get it in your body and you bring emotion to it, and enough motion, enough repetition, it gets in your body, and now it becomes physical mastery. You don't think about it and you just do it. Mastery is tying your shoes. If you do something enough, you're confident enough, you're certain enough, it's in your body, that's mastery. If you can become a person, engage others, you will now become an extraordinary leader, not a mediocre or good one. As far as I'm concerned, good is the enemy of great. When you can engage people, there is no limit to the resources you can access. If you want real wealth, wealth is access to resources. You don't have to own them all, just access to them all. You can do whatever you want, go wherever you want to go. That's real wealth. And you can do it if you can engage people. And engaging people is a finding a way to meet their needs, not yours. If you meet their needs, your needs can be met as well. And it can be done in a way that has integrity and love and vision and creativity, and it can truly be a synergy. I believe complexity is the enemy of execution. That's what it is. You gotta make it so simple, people do it. Complexity is the enemy of execution. There is no passion, there is no intimacy without energy, am I right? You're not gonna go to build a business without energy. And if we can find a way to increase our energy, and here's the good news about it, it's psychology and it's movement. The way you move will create it. Can you have everything in your life work out and still be in a lousy state? To influence other people, you have to know what already influences them. Everyone's different, but there are some universals. And one thing that influences all of us is our state. So we need to train ourselves to be in a better state. And the second thing that affects what we do long-term, besides our state, that's what affects things moment to moment, is we all have a set of beliefs or expectations, or we might call it a blueprint for how life's supposed to be. When life is in alignment with our blueprint, we're happy, we're not, we're upset. Sometimes there's nothing wrong with life, we just need to update our blueprint. Let's start with just changing our state, and let's learn something about how your brain blueprints things. So if you own your fear, you can figure out where it is and actually how to change it in seconds. And when fear is no longer around, fear is your only enemy. Because when fear is not there, nothing stops you. Why do you meet the devil at the crossroads at midnight? Maybe that's when you examine your conscience or it examines you. And then you might ask, well, why do you meet the devil at the crossroads? And the answer is most fundamentally because when you come to a place in your life where you have to make a choice, you aim up or down. And there is always an agent of temptation at every choice point, enticing you to aim down. Faith is the courage to not take that path despite the evidence that that might be justified. And so I think it is a form of courage in the highest sense. And I also think it is a redeeming form of courage do not take advantage of your illness as an excuse. And you know, if you don't think there are things that are worse than fatal, you have not suffered because there are things that are much worse than fatal. That's one temptation, right? That's the temptation of, of kind of faithless hopelessness. And then, and on me, you might say, uh, existential angst that you allow to pervade yourself. And I'm not saying you won't have your reasons, because you will. I'm saying that the reasons don't justify the conclusion, and they certainly don't justify the conclusion, not self-evidently, and they don't justify the conclusion in any simple deterministic sense. When you're at the crossroads and you're counseled to despair, you know, rise up in courage and see if you can resist it. It's better for you and it's better for the people around you. So, you know, people have asked me, for example, I'm very opposed to the idea that the fundamental human motivation is power, which is pretty much what every student is taught at every level of their education, in every educational institution, except a handful now across your country. Fundamental motivation is power. 
There's no place for people of goodwill to meet and, have, and engage in constructive dialogue, dialogos, none of that, because our fundamental motivation is nothing but the will to power. And so there is no place for people of goodwill to meet. There is no such thing as dialogue. It's all a mask, a rationalization, a post hoc rationalization for pretension and power. It's such a dismal philosophy. You could not formulate a more pathological philosophy. It obliterates your faith in society and it er eradicates the notion of the individual. It removes the notion of good faith and goodwill and it makes communication impossible. That's a temptation to engage in that sort of destruction as a consequence of your intellectual pretensions, let's say. And for all of you, you this is going to face you too, this pretension, you know? So maybe you're not the hopeless type and, and, and the temptation that assails you at the crossroads isn't your degeneration into a kind of faithless nihilism. Maybe it's a self-aggrandizement in some sense instead, and in that you feel that now you have the opportunity to serve your own ambition. Well, we, we can take apart what that means, because I think it's worthwhile. Psychopaths serve their own ambition. And they're the people who are most truly motivated by power, by the way, if you think about it clinically. And they're not very successful, all uh, protestations to the contrary. They never rise above about 3% of any general population. And maybe it's a better strategy to be a psycho man manipulative psychopath than to lay inert on your, in your bed, in your mother's bedroom when you're 40. But it's not an optimal strategy. And so you can be, get away with it being a psychopath because you can mimic competence and you can take advantage of people who have learned to expect the best from others and so you can manipulate them. But you produce nothing on your own. And one of the things that's really interesting about psychopaths is they don't learn from experience, which means not only do they betray other people constantly, but they betray their own future selves.